All right. Good to be with you guys today. Our 2024 theme is called. We are in our sixth week of a series titled, We Are Called to the Downside Up Life. And one of the things that I hope you're picking up is how practical the downside up life really is. I mean, it's full of daily practical living advice. And speaking of daily living advice, we haven't done that for a while. So honoring yesterday is May the 4th, right? May the 4th be with you. A big day for Star Wars geeks. I mean, fans. So as a shout out to sci-fi fans everywhere, Here's a piece of daily living advice just for you. Some of you may never get that. If you're a sci-fi geek, you do and you treasure it. Now, for the kingdom folks, let's take a look at may the fourth be with you through God's downside up lens. See who that is? Yeah, the fiery furnace. And who's the fourth? Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and the man of God that we think may have very well been Jesus. May the fourth be with you. And in full transparency, while I like the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the fourth holy person in their graphic the best, I really did like the Spock one too. Hopefully proving that you can be a sci-fi nut and a kingdom first follower at the same time. All right, all right, all right. So back to the action, the sermon action. Next slide. So, oh, I don't know how that got in there. I'm so sorry. It's, I, I just, oops, don't know how that got in there. But I did want to explain to you his namesake. His name is Daniel Pierre, no last name, because his daddy's name, no middle name, sorry, no middle name. Always great to have my helper let me know what I did wrong. <laughs> but she's right, no middle name. So he's Daniel Pierre Jr. And as they were explaining that to the birth certificate folks, Lauren was quick to throw in, and because my dad's name is Daniel. Yeah. And I, I love my name because of the friend of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel, and the things that I've learned from him as I consider him my namesake. I don't know if that's where my mom and dad got it, but that's where I choose to stand now. And so those lessons I will be happy and eager to teach Daniel Pierre Jr. All right, for, the, for real this time, Let's go to the sermon action. We are in six week, in the sixth week of our We Are Called to the Downside Up Life series. And this is the third week of looking at the downside up of obedience. Ugh. We're exploring the beauty of obedience. <laughs> and discovering that obedience really is a four-letter word. L-O-V-E. Yeah, the, 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 the next one. Oh, oh, what's up there is different than what's up here. So I was freaking out a little bit. Spock showed back up. L-O-V-E. Happy shutter, happy shutter, yay! Last week we saw that beauty, we saw the beauty in obedience through the life of Jesus. Jesus being God himself chose and purposefully became fully obedient to his father in order to accomplish the father's perfect plan. And through his power and through his resurrection to bring us to the father as well. And we started this obedience thing two weeks ago with Naaman. And we discovered that that Bible episode of Naaman revealed for us a great treasure of truth about obedience. That obedience is the golden nugget. You see what I did there? The great treasure of truth, the golden nugget that opens the door to God's movement, to God's desires, to God's desired action, what he wants to do in this world. 
to God's intervention. Not that we can stop God from doing anything, but God chooses to wait until the door is opened, and that door is opened through our obedience. Now, there are times that God does things that he wants to do despite our inobedience. But for the most part, and for God's desire, God's heart is to work through our obedience. Another golden nugget that Naaman's adventure in obedience teaches us, reminds us of, us kingdom folks. I'm talking about kingdom folks because remember, Naaman wasn't a kingdom folk. Not at the beginning of that Bible episode anyway. But Naaman teaches us how fascinating it is that God our Father teaches us crucial and critical life lessons in his, in his beautiful word about our relationship with God, about our life with him, about what he expects of us, about who we are, about how our standard human thinking doesn't match up and what he wants our thinking to be more like. He reveals those things very often in Scripture through those outside the kingdom. I just find that fascinating. So as you read your scriptures, pay particular attention to those outside the kingdom. And you can think of example after example, I'm sure. Some of my favorites, the woman caught in adultery. Now she may be a fallen believer, but in that current state, you might say outside the circle, And all, I, mean, it, I could do a whole sermon, and maybe at some point that would be a good sermon to do, but we, we need to move on. But just remember, as you read, God reveals so much about himself, his character, and what he wants from us through those outside the kingdom. Not the centurion in the Gospels. All right, all right, all right. Well, let's jump into Downside Up, week six. And it's all again about obedience. Obedience week three. So let's go to 1 Peter 15. Oh, I mean, I'm sorry. 1 Peter 1, 16. On your order of worship on the top there, I, what, what, what does it say? Does it say 15 or 16? It says, it says 15. No, I, I'm sorry. On the order of worship, the side with the songs. Yeah. No. It should be 16. So scratch that out. It was a long week. <laughs> Wonderful week. <laughs> no, so make, make that correction on your order of worship. So as another shout out to our Star Wars fans, Yoda fans in particular, let me go over with you what the Greek means or what the Greek more literally says on that scripture on the top of your order of worship. It says, <clears throat> holy you shall be, holy you shall become, because holy I am. The Hebrew more literally reads, become holy you shall, because holy I am. That was a shout out to Yoda fans. Maybe not so good. Y'all are just as asleep as I am, apparently. Johnny Willikers. Okay. Now, let's dig in. Obedience, I believe, is next to holiness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Where'd that come from? Well, in fine Jesus Sermon on the Mount fashion and form, let me put it this way. You've heard it said that cleanliness, cleanliness is next to godliness? Well, I tell you, obedience is next to holiness. How did I get there? Well, let's dig in. So let's go to that next slide. There we go. Our scripture for today is 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. But as you know, I can't just do one scripture because scripture does not stand by itself on its own. 
especially in the letters in the New Testament. I say especially in the letters, and that's not true, especially in all of the writings. The closest you might get to standalone scriptures would be in the Proverbs, where you have these bumper stickers of wisdom, bam, 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 bam. And yet, those don't even stand on their own. They are based on the holiness and the goodness and the kindness, the chesed of God, and what he expects of us, those of us who desire to have a relationship with him and commit ourselves to have a relationship with him. So Peter, remember, one of the apostles, trained with Jesus, walked with Jesus, saw Jesus do the miracles, feed the 5,000, all of those things, denied Jesus at a most critical moment, and then came back to Jesus. And yet, stumbled along the way. Do you remember what Paul said? That Good old Peter. Paul had to correct him. Paul had to confront him. Because Peter got sucked into the Jews versus Gentile argument and started siding with the Jews and maybe in not necessarily obvious ways, but in fellowship type ways and things. And Paul had to confront him. Well, that's the Peter that wrote this letter, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And he's writing it to a church that is suffering. Suffering because they are living faithfully. And it's made up mostly, and I mean by far mostly, of Gentiles. Of non-kingdom people that have come into the kingdom but they have come into the kingdom and they understand the story. Now, the New Testament hasn't been put together yet. and hadn't come out in a bound form yet. And so the scriptures that they understand are what we call the Old Testament. And that's incredibly important to remember as you read 1 Peter and 2 Peter and the whole Bible. The background of, the, of our, what we call New Testament, the Old Testament, is the foundational teaching upon which those writings came from, were birthed from, and helped to explain. That help to explain actually goes both ways. The New Testament informs some of the, those Old Testament sayings and, and hopes and desires and prophecies. But the Old Testament is the foundational knowledge that helps us to understand that which was written in the New Testament about Jesus and about the church, the called, the chosen. And Peter is banking on that and has obviously trained the readers of this letter deeply in Old Testament Scripture. I mean, just listen to the first couple of verses here. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, so he's laying down his authority. I need you to listen to this. I need you to remember that I'm an apostle, that I have been trained by Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the one that we were waiting for. To those who are exiles, elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who have been chosen and destined by God the Father. That line right there is full of Jewish language. Very Jewish language. He's counting on when they heard these words, they would immediately go back to the story of God and the people of God being scattered. And even in the midst of that scattering, because the enemies were intruding and invading and conquering, God took care of his people and brought them back. Remember that story because they suffered. Remember that story because in your suffering, you can remember the end of the story. Or as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story. God is with you. God is acting in the midst of this dispersion. And God will triumph and conquer. And listen to what he says about that. We've been chosen and destined by God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. That word sanctifying literally is being made holy. The Spirit's work in our lives, one of the Spirit's main tasks in our lives is to help us become holy, which is Leviticus eleven forty four. We are becoming holy. We are in the process of being molded and shaped and given ears to hear God's leading and to follow those good works that He's prepared in advance for us to do. He's making us holy. He's in that process. 
listen to this, through the holifying work, holifying work of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ. In this statement, that's the goal. That we are made holy so that we are obedient to Jesus Christ. Why is that so important? Because obedience to Jesus is following in his footsteps. And remember where the footsteps of Jesus took all of mankind to a new level it had never experienced before. Of intimacy with God the Father. Of salvation for those who were not born by blood into the chosen people. For adoption. For forgiveness. For strength. For being lifted up into the holy places, as Paul would say in Ephesians 1 and 2. Into the very holy places of heaven. The obedience of Jesus led to the greatest revolution humanity has ever seen and ever known. And if we are to be made holy, and if we are to become obedient, I believe it opens the floodgates to God's power to work in this world that is falling farther and farther away from Him. We have a tendency, we have a tendency as Americans to be a little short-sighted in this area. We think that the things that we're suffering now are the worst things anyone has ever suffered. I mean, we, we just have that kind of mindset. And that's really very, very far from the truth. The Christians in the early days were losing business, were losing businesses, were losing their livelihoods because they were claiming Jesus Christ as the Son of God, the one and only true and living God. So the Romans didn't like them, and the Jews were getting to a place where they couldn't stand them either. They were on these islands alone because they were being obedient to Jesus Christ. And in the years to come, and we're talking about the very near years to come, they would pay for their obedience, for their loyalty, for their making holy the name of God with their lives. Many of them tarred, poured upon them, and then lit on fire to light the streets of Rome. Some fed to the lions given a chance to denounce Jesus and really given a chance to just say, Caesar is Lord, but refusing. We live in a world that is changing. The morals are in upheaval. What is okay today is, in, I believe, in many ways, disgusting to the heart of God. And we will pay a price for standing up. But what Peter is saying is, it's a price worth paying. That's what the life of Jesus shows. The obedience of Jesus to God the Father showed it was worth the ultimate price of the ultimate torture because of the ultimate reward we enjoy. And not just the ultimate reward of heaven, but the ultimate reward of this family life. We have a people, a family we can depend on that goes beyond blood. And he's in the process of making us holy for obedience to Christ so that not only we understand that better, but enjoy it more fully and live it more soundly and more obviously and with more confidence. Now, I'm not saying that we go up to somebody and slug them on the side of the head with a Bible and say, you shouldn't be living like that. No, we lead always with love. That's what broke the backs of so many of the Romans. I forget one of the church fathers' names. I've just drawn a blank at the moment. In the stadium, with the lions ready to be released, and being a leader of many of God's people at that moment, he was given one final opportunity to quit being an atheist and pronounce Caesar as Lord. 
And this old man, this old, old frail man stood up, waving his arm, as historians recount, and said, Behold the atheist shall not deny my Lord Jesus Christ. They let the lions loose, tore them to pieces. But Rome lost his heart for that kind of torture because this man's life was a life of love. Love will change the world. Trusting God will change the world. Obedience to Jesus will change the world because it is God's power working and flowing and moving through obedience. That's how Peter starts out his letter. And just to wrap that little intro up, he says, for obedience to Jesus Christ, for sprinkling with his blood, so that we are constantly covered in the blood of Jesus, reminded of Jesus' sacrifice, and that's what we hang on to. Not the trappings, not the pressures, not the mindset of this world, but on the grace that we have been given. And then he says, he ends this intro, this opening, may, pay, may, pace, may grace and peace, that, that's how you say grace and peace together in one word, pace. May grace and peace be multiplied to you, literally, literally be yours in abundance. Peace, reminding every believer at that time and every Jew, shalom. The peace of God that passes all understanding because it is more than no conflict. It is a wholeness, a fullness, a contentment that is rich and undeniable. And grace, that which we receive from being sprinkled by Jesus' blood. So it's not just forgiveness. It is a life of wholeness and fullness and belonging. Be yours in abundance. Everything that follows in Peter's letter not only supports but grows out of this incredible introduction. We are and are in the continuing process of becoming God's holy people. Peter's, again, taking these mostly Gentile followers of Jesus who are suffering for living their faith-filled lives and encouraging them by calling on them I'm slipping the theme in, by calling on them and calling on us to remember, and I'm talking about in that anamnesis way where they remember the story and make it their own. They relive the story in their minds and in their hearts and they believe that it happened and they believe that they are part of that story. He calls on them to remember and to continue to engage in the singular and continuing plan of God. Now keep that firmly in mind and let's dig into the verses for today. And I'm telling you, the, the reading is so beautiful and covers so much ground and there's no way we're going to get to even half of it. We're just going to do 13, 14, 15, and 16. We're going to fly through those just to make the points. But the end of the reading is so wonderful. I need to, I need to just say one thing about it and then we'll move on. The end of the reading begins the process of Peter talking about what it is to be holy, what being holy looks like. We are redeemed from an empty way of life. We were redeemed by something beautiful and wonderful, the precious blood of Jesus, the perfect lamb. We're, we've purified ourselves by obeying the truth so that we have sincere love for each other. It's part of that beautiful reward, the beautiful natural outpouring of a life obedient to Jesus, of a holy life that we, we see Jesus in one another. We see the value that Jesus has for you and we treasure you for it. And we, we come closer and closer to one another, becoming interdependent, joyfully upon and with and through one another, encouraging one another, 
correcting one another when it's called for, but in all things, loving each other so deeply that we would, like we would for our own children, take a bullet for them, take a bullet for you. Love one another deeply from the heart, for you have been born again. The idea being not born of this world, but born of God's kingdom. And we're becoming like God, thinking like God. We are, as Gary said, other. God's economy, God's ethics, God's values, God's presence, God's kindness, God's love. That's what the holy life, that's what the obedient life is calling us to. Let's see how he gets there. Verse 13. You know what? I'm going to keep, I'm going to hang on to this. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your heart on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. Minds that are alert and sober is literally gird up your loins. When you're wearing a robe and you want to run, gentlemen, you can't. Ladies, in a pencil skirt, you ain't running. And so in biblical dress, you grab and pull it up and tie it around your waist so it looks like you've got a great big diaper on. And then you can run. It just means get ready. Be prepared. It means count the cost as you prepare. In, 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 its, uh, uh, in its euphemistic meaning, to gird up your loins was you have prepared and now you're going into it. So be prepared and get busy. Effective soldiers, world-class athletes, Jesus facing the cross, all prepare in advance. And not only physically, but mentally, they'll all tell you, is most important. Prepare your minds for action. Be fully sober. That is pretty literal. It means to be self-controlled. To avoid the things that will take your mind off of your preparations. To focus in on the goal, to focus in on the task, and don't let anything else get in your field of vision. One of the things I love about my wife is she, when she sets her mind to something, you can pretty much just check it off the list because it's done. Now, what that does practically is she can get so hyper-focused that she doesn't hear what's, what's around her. There was one time that uh, when I was a youth minister in Houston, I was leaving the building to go run an errand, and she was coming in to drop off Lauren. I saw her car. And so from 100 yards away, I started blaring my horn and flashing my lights all the way, all the way, all the way, all the way, all the way. She never saw me because she was focused on getting our daughter to gingerbread school. That, that is being self-controlled. That is being fully sober, according to the text. These two phrases complement one another and bring a sense of balance. When he says, set your hope, that word for set is balance your hope on the grace to be brought to you. Balance your hope. And remember, the Old Testament word for trust, how is it translated into the Greek Old Testament? The Hebrew word for trust in the Old in the Septuagint, the Old Testament version written in Greek, is not translated pistuo, faith or believe. It's translated hope. We miss that because we tend as Americans to think of hope as I want something and I wish it to be true. I wish it to come to me. But for the Christian, for the Jew, hope is a rock solid expectation of the future. 
So set your hope, set your reward, set your sure knowledge that you are saved now and forever. On the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is coming. You see how that makes so much sense? When Jesus comes back, there's no doubt we're going home. And our relationship, when it is a relationship based on our obedience to Jesus, and we're not going to be perfect, okay? We know that. He knows that. That's why he sent Jesus in the first place. If we could be perfectly obedient, we wouldn't need Jesus. But we need Jesus. And so the blood is sprinkled upon us, and he chooses to see us as holy. And he is in the process of making us holy forming us into holiness so that we can be more and more fully obedient to Jesus so that we can place our hope firmly upon the grace that will we know be brought to us when Jesus comes back. We are to live lives of confidence. God loves us. He has saved us. We are going home. And right now we are home because he is here with us. I'm running out of time. I want to be I want to, want, want to be concise here. The very next line, as obedient children. And I want to get away from shuddering when I see obedient. And I want to get to the point where I say, I want to be an obedient child. Not so that I don't get in trouble, but so that I understand God more fully and I enjoy God more fully. And the life that he has designed because it is beautiful downside up life. Proverbs 3, my son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart. Trust. There's that word that in the Greek Old Testament is hope in the Lord, in Yahweh with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding but in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. God will lead you the right way. Follow God and life will be good and rich and full. Shalom will cover you and be your guide. Do not conform to the evil desires, verse 14 still, that you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, Be holy because I am holy. Peter is quoting from Leviticus again, calling to the one story, to the foundation of who they are and what they are becoming. Our God is holy. He is other. He is different from this world and we know that and see that so clearly. And that's who we are becoming. And we need to, to grasp that and enjoy that and love that. And just as God so loved the world that he gave his only son, we need to love this world so much that we give ourselves as well to the world so that they might see God Almighty and his beauty. If all we're doing is throwing around judgments and putting our nose in the air thinking we're better than anybody else, they will never see. I've heard it said one time, uh, I think it was Keller, but I'm not sure. There are five Gospels. Wait a minute, preacher. There's only four. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's a fifth. You. Me. And people will not read and discover and know anything about the other four until they see the Gospel in us first. That's what being holy is all about. That's what becoming holy is meant for. That's what obedience to Jesus Christ leads us to becoming. And it opens the door again for God's beautiful, powerful, intimate interaction in this world. Peter is once again tying the life of the follower of Jesus to the Old Testament. It's one story. It's one God. It always has. It always will be. This is God's call on our life to be holy because He is holy.
in my notes here I have, we are to be in the world, but not of the world. I think we've made that plenty clear. So we're just going to get going. So very quickly, Coraline, would you, would you bring me that, uh, that, that whiteboard? Very, very, very quickly, let's brainstorm. What does it mean to be holy? Or what, let me say, let me ask it this way. What other scriptures come to mind when you think of this idea of being holy as we've unpacked it? And let me get, let me get us started. As I was studying for this, thank you very much, and, and, and working through this and trying to figure this out, there were two scriptures that just kind of haunted me. And they were Matthew 9, I'm sorry, Matthew 6, 9 through 13. Anybody want to identify that? Our Father in heaven, hallowed, honored, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on this earth in my life. As it is, as beautifully, as perfectly, as fully as it is in heaven. The other one was Romans 11, 33 through 12, 2 and following. Oh, the depth and the, of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments, his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. Therefore, in light of how great our God is, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. And remember, when the New Testament says mercy, that's the Old Testament saying chesed. In view of God's great kindness, his mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. What else do we have to give but everything? Because he's given so much to us. Don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will, unwritten so that you can obey Jesus more fully. What else? Any others come to mind as we were going through all this? Anyone? And and keep them keep an eye out for our uh, uh, zoomers too, Philippians. <sighs> Philippians two. Emptied himself. And the the neat thing is the introduction to that whole beautiful hymn, is. May your mindset be like that of Christ Jesus. Follow in His footsteps. Obey. Be obedient to the life of Jesus. Yes, sir. Uh, Leviticus 20. Tell me. Oh, who makes you holy. Put in a plug for Dave's Bible class. I, I, I kind of get the feeling that the entire class is going to be about becoming holy, being made holy. Holy, study in Leviticus. Today was awesome. I just think it's going to get, continue to be that good and as it builds on itself like a snowball rolling downhill, just gaining power. And, oh, it's just going to be wonderful. Paul. Acts 2.38. Okay, talk. Uh, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Okay, that's for Peter. Acts 2.38. Yeah. Which, uh, Acts 2.38, and Peter said to them, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's job is? Make us holy. 
I mean, it's, it's just so interweaved. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. Any others? Jen? Ooh. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Just beautiful. Don't let anything slow you down. Don't let anything get in your way. Always reaching for Jesus. Nice. Nice. Do we have any Zoomers have anything? Is it? Second Timothy 1.12. Ah, I know whom I have believed. Tara, nicely done, Tara. That's great. I know whom I, I have believed. We have a song about that. Why didn't I put that song in here this week? Wow, that's going to be making an appearance in, a, in, a, in an order of worship near you. Any others? It's just fun, to, and I think this is what happens when we meditate on the Word of God. When we take the time to really think about it and let it challenge us and let it flow through us, another one of the Holy Spirit's job is to remind us of the things that we already know. And I believe the Holy Spirit joins us in those times of meditation and of deep thinking and brings to our recollection those other places in Scripture that, that fortify and that inform and that add to and clarify and beautify what we're studying and what we're meditating on. Philippians 4, 8 might be another one. I've got it here somewhere. Ah. Well, let me start in verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. I think that's something we need to get better at, is rejoicing in the Lord. I mean, He's done so much for us, and it's so awesome. Yay! Let your gentleness be evident to all. Thank you, Carrie. The Lord is near. I mean, he's talking about reasons to rejoice. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, because the Lord is near, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, the shalom of God, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, right after that, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Oh. And then he adds, whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. He's not saying anything arrogant there. He's saying... I'm working so, and, and they know, the Philippians know this. They love Paul because of this, because he is explaining to them with his life and his words the beauty of the life in Christ, of obedience to Christ, of holiness in Christ. And so he says, Imitate me. That's literally what a rabbi was to do with his students, what the students were to do with their rabbis was to imitate them, to learn from them and be so intimate with them that they could carry on that work. And that's what we are doing with Jesus. That's what Paul was doing with Jesus. And so he says, come with me. And so our job in becoming holy and obediently following Jesus is get to the place where we can confidently say to another, follow me as I follow Jesus. And you'll know good life. You'll know shalom. You'll know chesed. You'll know the peace of God that transcends all understanding. Second Peter chapter one. His divine power has given us everything we need for godly life. Through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness, through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises. And a promise from God is a fact. So that through them, we may participate in the divine nature. Isn't that just another way of saying you're being sanctified in order to be obedient to Jesus? Having escaped the corruption of the world caused by evil desires, 
For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith. And remember, this is an ingredients list, not a ladder of success. Add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control. To self-control, perseverance. To perseverance, godliness. And to godliness, mutual affection. And to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these quantities in increasing measure, as God continues to make you holy and more holy, and you become more and more obedient to Jesus Christ, in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, in your relationship, in your intimate knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Just beautiful, wonderful stuff. Man, this idea of, of be, let's be holy, let's be kind, let's be, that might make a good thing. Hmm, something to think about. Okay, so what do you think? What is the downside up of be holy? I mean, I'm, as a youth minister, I would hear periodically, holy? We can't be holy. We're crummy. Yeah, that's true. But the beauty is God makes us holy. But as somebody said in class today, God expects our effort and our movement towards the goal. We may never get there, but God brings us along. God empowers us. God is right in the middle of it. Let me tell you what a couple of, of, of my commentaries said. The interpretation series says, this emphasis about this verse in particular, verse 16, this emphasis on obedience does not wipe out the mercy that readers have experienced in their call to become Christians. The inheritance that Christians expect, that great hope, because they belong to this new household of faith is far greater than anything they might lose by obedience to the will of God. Now, I like that. And I would never say that I'm smarter than these people doing these, these, these analysis. But I would like to add, for your consideration, anything that we might lose because of our obedience to God is far outweighed by the beauty and depth and richness and wholeness, that shalom, that we gain in our new life of faith and trust. In obedience. That's the value, the worth, the reality of the be holy life. That's the value, the worth, the reality of the downside up life, the fully obedient life. Because we rock solid believe, trust, and stand upon this great hope that God is our Father that God is the ruler of the universe, that God is the creator of the universe, and that he is the absolute power of this universe, and that his name is L-O-V-E. And we are his beloved children. So that's our name, too. Here it is on the bumper sticker. There it is. Holiness is dwelling in in the beautiful, downside-up life. Let's say that together. Holiness is dwelling in the beautiful, downside-up life. I forgot the word life. It works, though, the other way. Okay. Praise team, go ahead and come on up. Out of deep and overwhelming gratitude... We fall down before God Almighty. We beg Him for His mercy, for His kindness, for His chesed. And then we rise up in confidence as His adopted and beloved children. Hungry and joyfully anxious to know Him more fully and to become more and more like Him through our obedience to Him. Our holy Father, our holy example, our holy blessing. He is the God of wonders, and He is holy. And He is dwelling with us, among us, and within us, making us, shaping us, so that we become holy, so that we become other like Him. 
so that the world may see him and hunger for his holiness too. Amen? Let's stand and sing this song.